You see, moon and star, Mars is the fourth planet from the sun and the outermost of the rocky planets. Compared to Earth, it has a significantly more elliptical orbit, with Mars being 1.38 astronomical units close to the sun at perihelion, to then retract as far as 1.67 AE at aphelion. A year on Mars lasts the equivalent of 687 days or 1.88 Earth years. The day length on Mars is on the other hand close to that of Earth, lasting 24 hours and 38 minutes. What is more difficult to adjust to for astronauts than the day length is the low gravity. Mars is only about half the diameter of Earth and thus has only about 38% of our home world's gravity. Mars has no large moon like Earth, instead only two smaller satellites called Phobos and Deimos, which might either be captured asteroids or the remnants of protoplanetary collisions. The magnetosphere of Mars is weak and partially regionalized by magnetized rocks. Modern Mars lacks any oceans or comparable large bodies of water. Today, the Martian surface consists largely of layers of volcanic rock, laid over by thin sheets of sand and dust. These are what mainly gives Mars its red coloration, as they consist of eroded iron oxides. In general, the Martian crust is much richer in iron than that of Earth, likely because the lower gravity did not pull most of the iron atoms towards the planet's core during its formation. Under the volcanic layer are often deep pockets of ice and in warm enough regions groundwater. Under the ice usually lies primordial regolith. In the more polewood regions, the water lies much closer to the surface in the form of permafrost, creating tundraic environments fit for the mongrel nords of Skyrim. Sedimentary rocks are mostly common in the northern hemisphere for reasons soon discussed. As Mars lacks oceans by which to cartograph coastlines, the planet's geography is best explained by use of a topographical map. As can be clearly seen, there is a significant dichotomy between the low-lying and almost smooth-surfaced northern hemisphere and the taller, much more cratered and ancient southern hemisphere. If this difference evolved through massive impact events in the north or through internal tectonic processes is not known. Ironically, the highest point on Mars, the titanic shield volcano Olympus Mons, lies in the northern hemisphere, while the lowest point, the Hellas Basin, lies in the south. There is good reason to believe that most of the lower northern hemisphere was once the basin of an ancient ocean, hence the many sedimentary layers found here and the fossil deltas and estuaries that can be found at the north-south boundary. The remnants of this ocean now lie beneath the surface in the form of massive fields of permafrost ice around the polar circles. Mars has stopped having plate tectonics very early in its history, with features like Valles Marineris being the last remnants of such processes. What mostly shapes the surface of the planet are thus impact and dust storm events, the formation and eruption of massive shield volcanoes, erosion and deposition by seasonal streams of water and especially glaciers, as well as the actions of lithotrophic organisms. Geosyncline forces created by the shrinking of the cooling planet may also be an important, though understudied, factor. While the crust is mostly inactive, the core remains molten, and many of the volcanoes still show signs of fairly recent activity. The average air pressure felt on Mars at mean global altitude is 0.51 bar, which is the pressure you would feel on Nern if you were standing on top of High Hrothgar. One may question how Mars has a relatively complex ecosystem with such low pressures while mountaintops on Earth are deserted. But the latter case is usually more due to the topography than the air pressure. Flat plateaus of similar altitudes in the Andes Mountains are stable enough to give space for vegetation to grow and animals to roam and such is also the case on the wide plains of Mars. The air on Mars consists mainly of 75% carbon dioxide, 10% hydrogen, 9-10% to oxygen, 3% nitrogen, and the remaining 2% consisting of noble and volcanic or biogenic greenhouse gases. This is in stark contrast to Earth's, where nitrogen and oxygen are the main constituents. While the pressure is survivable enough without a spacesuit, under current conditions, an astronaut with a broken breathing gear will suffocate on Mars, as has infamously and unfortunately happened to a crew member of the Horus 4 operation. The native life is, however, perfectly in tune with the planet's nature. The vast majority of life forms on Mars, including the multicellular flora and fauna, 
are either obligate or facultative hydrogenotrophic methanogens. This means they can react the CO2 of the atmosphere with H2 to generate the energy they need for living. The waste products of this metabolism are water and methane, which rise into the air as greenhouse gases before the sun breaks them up into their constituents, which are then breathed in again by the life forms. Through this cycle, life on Mars has apparently been able to keep conditions for itself habitable for a long time, though it has not been able to completely stave off the loss of the atmosphere and much of the water vapor to the solar winds. Oxygen appeared in the Martian atmosphere only gradually and later in its history and is used only secondarily by its biosphere. Its concentration in the atmosphere is just high enough that macroscopic multicellular organisms can use it for respiration and also just low enough that anaerobic organisms are not too impeded by its presence. Many of the Martian animals possess a complex lung system that can utilize both forms of respiration, though to differing degrees. There are mainly three pathways by which oxygen is produced on Mars, and we will discuss these in another video. A rather bizarre factor about the atmosphere and a major challenge to engines and reactors is that it is potentially explosive, as hydrogen and oxygen can react violently with each other in the so-called Nalgas reaction. However, the auto-ignition temperature of this reaction is under normal Earth conditions 500 degrees Celsius and even higher on Mars with its low atmospheric pressure. As most of the planet is very cold and there is not much vegetation to cause wildfires, this reaction does not occur naturally outside of rare lightning strikes. When those do happen, they are truly devastating. Acts of gods, such as myself, is perhaps the only apt description. Thankfully, the fires caused by these explosions are short-lived, as the product of the null gas reaction is water, which douses the flames. The most major factor that actually impedes life on Mars are the low concentrations of nitrogen. This has, however, led to some remarkable innovations by nitrogen-fixing life forms. Mars is generally a very cold place. While the mean annual temperature on Earth is around 14 degrees Celsius, the long distance from the sun and the thinner atmosphere conspire to make the MAT on Mars only about 2 degrees Celsius, only a little bit above the melting point of water. Due to the varied geography, this temperature is, however, not equally distributed. The southern hemisphere is usually much colder than the northern one, with the geographical delineation between the northern lowlands and the southern highlands also being the zero-degree isotherm. Most of the south, therefore, has an MAT below freezing point, and the region is mostly covered in year-long ice all the way up to latitude 60 degrees south. Temperatures above freezing point occur in most of the highlands only in the warmest parts of summer for only 100 Mars days or less. The exception to this cold southern climate is the quite warm Hellas Basin, thanks to its depth generating higher air pressures and therefore greenhouse effects. Another especially cold region is the very tall Tharsis Plateau, whose volcanic summits stay frozen the whole year. Most of the northern hemisphere, meanwhile, enjoys mean temperatures that can reach from 10 to 20 degrees. Some of the warmest summer days may even peak above 40. On Earth, such temperatures would be enough to permit trees to grow. However, such vegetation is almost completely absent on Mars due to the aridity. Precipitation in the form of rain occurs only on 0.8% of the planet's surface and, ironically, only in the southern highlands, as the altitude causes adiabatic cooling of the clouds. The majority of precipitation, occurring on about 31% of the surface, instead comes in the form of snow. The north is therefore arid because most of the water that evaporates from it travels south and becomes trapped as snow or ice. Most complex flora is therefore dependent on meltwater coming from the polar ice caps and tundras or groundwater welling up from oases. In terms of the biomes of Mars, as one generally travels from the south to north pole and ignores special regions, one begins with eternal ice, followed by vast hyperalpine tundra, then thin bands of taiga, shrubland, and cold, craggy deserts, flat hot deserts, and flat cold deserts or steppes, followed by a thinner strip of flat tundra, and then again eternal ice. The aridity and lack of deep-rooted vegetation coupled with erosion creates large amounts of dust on Mars, which through summer heat becomes highly activated and can form into gigantic dust storms. 
These can sometimes envelop the whole planet for a few months. Most organisms have learned to cope with the ever-present dust, and some even thrive off it. The rather bizarre climate dichotomy of Mars hemispheres is explained by its seasons. A year on Mars lasts almost twice as long as on Earth, and its seasons are caused by its axial tilt. Currently, this tilt is at around 25 degrees, which is not actually that far off from Earth's value. However, Mars's orbit around the Sun is far more eccentric than on Earth. These conditions cause the Northern Hemisphere to be closest to the Sun during its winter and farthest during its summer, creating mild seasons. As a consequence, though, the Southern Hemisphere is farthest from the Sun during its winter and closest during its summer, making for more extreme seasons, especially combined with the long length of a year. There are plenty of signs that it has not always been like this. Mars, like the Earth, goes through Milankovitch cycles, wherein values like the axial tilt, precession changes, and the form of the orbit can vary in different cycles that usually last tens of thousands of years. Sometimes these cycles reinforce each other, sometimes they cancel each other out. There is now strong evidence that between 2 million and 400,000 years ago, a stronger axial tilt and a more circular orbit made Mars go through a warm age in which the MAT was higher and precipitation by rainfall was more common. Possible fossilized forests in Isidus Planitia may attest to this. Currently, Mars seems to be going through a colder phase, with conditions possibly getting even colder in the future, though some models also predict another warm age. As one goes even deeper into the past, changes become more drastic, as evidence amounts that up to two billion years ago, an actual ocean had existed on most of the northern hemisphere, the atmosphere was much thicker, and global temperatures may have reached 20 degrees on average. Fossils of megafauna and likely ancestors of modern life forms are known from this time. The reason for why Mars has stopped being this Earth-like is likely its lower gravity, making space escape of volatile gases in the atmosphere easier. Photolysis by the Sun has broken up much of the former water vapor into its constituents, with the much lighter hydrogen escaping into space and leaving oxygen behind. Though biosphere interactions and the buildup of an ozone layer have partially mitigated this, billions of years of solar bombardment have nonetheless taken their toll. I hope you enjoyed this video and look forward to the coming ones. Make sure to like and subscribe, visit the project's original website, and maybe also check out my Patreon, UNWA.